This movie always had a huge asterisk over it regarding how they were going to handle the death of Chadwick Boseman and what that would mean for the movie and the franchise as a whole. Well, the movie's out now and I couldn't be happier with the direction that Ryan Coogler and the team of Marvel Studios have taken. What's going on YouTube? My name's Jay Lee and I like a lot of stuff. Today I'm talking about Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I had pretty mixed feelings about the first Black Panther movie when I watched it. On one hand, the cultural impact was gigantic and seeing the outpour of support and recognition for the black community and its culture would eventually shape my reaction to seeing Shang-Chi on the big screen. More of that in a future video. On the other hand, I did find that the first movie fell into Marvel's usual formula, so story-wise, it didn't break new ground for a character and movie that I felt really deserved something a bit more special. It was especially a shame because the character of Killmonger was an S-tier villain, however you want to look at it. Michael B. Jordan was a beast in that role, and it was extremely disappointing that, spoilers for Black Panther, that his character arc ended after only one movie. When the sequel was announced, people were scratching their heads because, how the hell do you do a Black Panther movie without this man? For Disney and Marvel to go on without Chadwick Boseman, rest in peace, was bold to say the least. For them to announce that they weren't going to recast T'Challa raised all sorts of questions. Little did I know, the trailer already addressed that and the death of King T'Challa was integrated into the story. So there you go. No multiversal shenanigans, no tie-ins with Marvel's what if, but that's alright. What Marvel has done and how they decided to proceed demonstrates that no, they're not tone deaf. And yes, there was actually a valid and affecting story to tell in the wake of Chadwick's death. I'd say the film tributes both the actor and character with grace and integrity. The death is written in a way that feels very honest, very sincere. In fact, I'll say that is something Wakanda Forever does better than the first, creating emotional depth. This movie made me feel a lot, and not just because of the passing of an amazing actor and character, but feeling for the characters mourning the loss. And that was only made possible by extraordinary performances all around. Angela Bassett is given some heavy lifting and she absolutely crushes in this movie. She commands that boss bish vibe and the grieving mother veneer with poise and intensity. Just incredible stuff. And speaking of heavy lifting, for shorty actress Leticia Wright to be cast as the comedic little sister and then now thrust into the spotlight as this iconic titular character couldn't have been easy. She kills it and brings so much more than what we've seen from shorty as a character. Denai Guerrera, Lupita Nyong'o, and Winston Duke also return and shine brightly as ever. M'Baku's scenes were especially light in volume, but heavy in context. Oh my feels. I have to say I was pretty surprised by the casting choice of Tenoch Huerta as King Namor of Atlantis. <clears throat> I mean of Talo Khan, ever since that scene in Endgame. Get a reading on those tremors? Net. It's an earthquake under the ocean. People have been speculating and coming up with pretty awesome fan cast ideas. Daniel Day Kim seemed to be a popular choice. Brian T from Chicago Med and Tokyo Drift. Joe Taslam also has a really great look. And this actor, whom I've never heard of, has the perfect eyebrows to play Namor. In any case, what Marvel did by casting an actor of Mexican heritage was integrate an Aztec slash Mayan aspect into the villain's origin, which helps differentiate him from so many other stories that have been told about Atlantis. Sadly, I think this was the weak link in the film for me. Not that I was mad about the casting choice or Huerta's performance, but in the pursuit of fleshing out Namor's origin, it kind of felt rushed with the flashbacks and exposition scenes. It does well to create parallels between Talo Khan and Wakanda, but when there's so much more happening on an emotional level above the water, those side steps kind of felt incongruent with the rest of the movie. But when the movie starts to pop off, man, the action has been stepped up considerably. From the vehicular action to the weapons combat, it was all a lot of fun. When Namor joins the fray, however, it becomes something undeniably special. Unfortunately, fast cuts and shaky action are still very commonplace in these films, but the use of slow-mo gives you plenty of chances to soak in the spectacle. Another trend I've noticed with this current phase of movies is the need to usher in new generation characters. I mean, I'm all for it because hell, I just want more Marvel, but it can make a movie like this feel a bit over stuffed. At 2 hours and 41 minutes, it is definitely a long one, but when the director is dealt the kind of hand that forces him to address the death of a main character while introducing new villains and future heroes, I do think the runtime was used to its fullest potential. It wasn't all gold, but even with the jump around plot and shifting focus points, I was entertained throughout this movie. The hype moments are real, the emotional beats are earned, and the future of Wakanda feels like it's in a very good place for the next phase of movies. Ryan Coogler managed the near impossible task of following up Black Panther without his lead, and in a way that does the legacy justice while serving as a beautiful send-off for T'Challa. I'm gonna give Black Panther Wakanda Forever an 8.5 out of 10. For those who haven't watched it yet, there is a mid credit scene but no end credit scene. You're welcome. Come back soon to catch my thoughts on all the stuff I haven't talked about yet.